Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, which is a special one focused on the Australian Charities Report 2015. My name is Matt Crichton, I work here at the ACNC in the education team, and joining me today to present all the fascinating findings from the Charities Report is Ross Skillett, who is a research manager here at the ACNC. Hi Ross. Hi Matt. We'll get into all the um, details in, in, a, in a few moments, we'll get into all the, all the stats and the, and the fascinating findings, but first, Ross, if you wouldn't mind uh, just giving us a very brief outline of what, what this report is. Hmm. No problems. So as many of the um, people um, in this webinar would know, um, each year we collect data from charities on their annual information statement. And so what this report does is take a look at all the data that charities have submitted to us um, and really uh, puts back to the general public, charities and researchers, um, overall information about the charity sector in Australia. Okay, and the report itself, as we can see on the screen here, is um, a, a quite a large report done in collaboration, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, we've worked this year with the Centre for Social Impact and the Social Policy Research Centre at UNSW, um, who've done all the hard work of analysing the numbers for us um, and we've turned that into uh, yeah three reports so okay great which yeah. is it and it's an important point isn't it so that the report um, the readers of the report will know that it's not um, it's a collaboration uh, across a, a few independent institutions it's it's not done mm. entirely within one organization yeah that's right and we think that independence is really important as well the report itself is um, available freely and people can access it online. Can you give us a, an overview of, of uh, what they've got available to them? Yeah, sure. So the starting point for accessing all the reports uh, is this website, australiancharities.acnc.gov.au. And on that website, you'll find the um, different versions of the report that are available. So we've got the main report, which is 140 pages of quite detailed and comprehensive information about the sector, um, but obviously knowing that that's a lot to get through, we've also produced a two-page snapshot with the key stats and a 14-page summary with just a bit more detail. Okay, so if, if people don't have the time to, to get through 140 pages yep. and they wanted to just find out exactly, um, well, the most important things, the, the headline figures and, and information, then you'd recommend going to the, the shorter 14-page and two-page options. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned uh, just a, a minute or so ago that uh, there are three reports. Is that what this um, section on the slide here, sub-reports, is referring to? Yeah, so as well as that main report, um, which is available in three different versions, there's also two sub-reports. And the two sub-reports this year are on smaller charities and aged care charities. So each of those sub-reports is fairly short and just um, specifically profiles the charities in those two sectors. You said that it's housed at that website, australiancharities.acnc.gov.au, but um, the slide does call it an interactive website. So it's not simply just a spot where people can download a PDF of a 140-page report? There's more to it than that? Yeah, that's it. And in fact, that's the most exciting part, I'd say. So as well as downloading the reports, you can also explore the data in an interactive way. Um, and the great thing about that is you can filter it by whatever criteria you want so that you can get the stats for um, the specific question you're trying to answer. Okay, so it's not only the report then, it's, it's um, the data itself, the data that was used, that was analysed to produce the report is available to people at the website. Yeah, exactly. And they can play around with that and, and discover their own interesting findings and, and stats and whatnot. Yeah, they should. It's good fun. Okay, just moving on. This is the screen that you'll see if you do venture onto the website to have a look at the report. That's the home page. And just a quick note on that. Um, that the URL that we gave on the previous slide, australiancharities.acnc.gov.au, um, will work and get you here. But if you put a www at the beginning of that, it's unlikely to work. I've mm. discovered that um, the hard way by accident a few times. And um, if you, like I did, get an error message after you put www.australiancharities.acnc.gov.au, 
get rid of the www, try it again, and you should be all right. So that's what you'll see um, on the home page. And Ross, can you just take us, uh, we'll just give, give um, the viewers a brief overview of uh, where they should go and what, where they can find the things that they want to find. Yeah, sure. So the, on the left at the bottom there, you've got download. So that's where you click if you want to see the links to the actual research reports. Um, now the interactive data cubes can be accessed through either the explore or the sector buttons. Um, the explore ones are probably the best one to start with if you're just wanting to have a general look. If you are wanting to delve into a particular sector of the charity's population though, um, say education, you probably start by clicking on sector. Okay, so there's lots of ways to um, get at the data and have a look at it. Once people do get into it, just give an example here. This is the sort of thing that you'll see on the screen and um, the, the ways in which you can interact with the data presented, the data that was used to analyse um, the data that was analysed to produce the report. I'll get that right. Um, so, Ross, on this screen, we've we've uh, got an example of um, yep. what what the um, what viewers will be able to see. Can you briefly describe what they're looking at there? Yeah, sure. So they're just looking. This slide shows just one part of the interactive data cube. Uh, so this is the uh, geography section of the data cube. So that brings you up a map of Australia. Um, you can see there's a whole lot of dots all around the country there um, and some of them look like bigger dots and some are smaller dots. So each of those dots represents one charity um, and then the larger dots represent where there's a few charities bunched in one place like in a city or a town. Okay, we can see that on the map here. It sort of, I guess, um, resembles a population to a degree. You can see clusters around Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. Okay. Um, just just on that, it's got a map of Australia, but um, many of the viewers will will realise that a lot of charities operate overseas. Um, it, does it also have a map of the world, or, or is it n neglecting the charities that operate overseas? No, so definitely not. Um, so what this map's showing is where charities are based. Um, so charities are to be Australian charities um, need to be based here. Um, so every Australian charity would have um, an address in Australia. Um, rather than overseas, even though we do know that many of them operate overseas. Oh, okay. So it's not as if the, the data is neglecting those that operate overseas and we're just focusing on those that have operations in Australia. It's that their office or their, their headquarters is, is based here. Yeah, that's right. And that would be reflected in one of these green dots. That's right. And just to um, elaborate a bit more, if you were to hover um, in the real data cube, hover your mouse over one of those dots, it actually brings up um, all the information that that charity reported on their annual information statement for the year. Oh, okay, great. So if, if they um, know that well, they're hovering over the dot of the one that they're looking for, yep. um, then they can get a, get a quick brief overview of, of some of their information from this screen. Yeah, or if you're curious what a dot in the, what seems like in the middle of nowhere, yeah. what it is, you can hover over yeah, and see, right, see right. everything about it. <laughs> okay. And... At the top here on, on this screen, the screenshot of what people will see in the data cube, there are a few tabs there um, with geography, size and activities, income and expenditure, I think those two refer to, assets. These are other categories that, that people can click on and find information about? Yeah, that's right. So overview is uh, gives you obviously an overview or the headline stats for the whole sector. And then geography is this map. You've got also... You can look at other attributes like size and activities, finances, um, and employment. And you see on the um, side as well, it says filter this page. So in the map of Australia, it has filter this page. So that's just an example of how you can choose different items from that list and uh, change the way the data appears. Oh, okay. So you can break it down further from, from that. Yeah, that's yep. it. Okay, great. Um, so this is important to note, this isn't the first... Um, report that the ACNC has commissioned for um, to analyse the data from the annual information statements. Um, this is the third one, but this one um, has a few new features. Can you give us a um, an explanation of those? Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, um, we've worked on this in the 2013 and 14 AISs, but this year um, what we've been able to do is build the most comprehensive record to date of the whole sector. So. Um, the way we've done that is by bringing in um, data from charities who hadn't reported in 2015 but had reported in previous years. 
Um, and also in some cases we've, the researchers have made a very informed estimate um, of data that's, that's missing. So what we've been able to do in short is uh, put together data for 51,000 charities, which is almost all of the charities on the register. Okay, so the, the first couple of reports um, didn't have this number. They, they were um, analysing the data of fewer charities? Yeah, that's right. So the first report, I think, had about 35,000, and again, the same with the second report. So this is a significant increase on that. Yeah, right, for sure. Um, you mentioned that um, the researchers were able to make informed um, estimates based on uh, previous data or, or estimates for charities that didn't have any data. Yeah. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So um, there are some charities that for whatever reason either haven't reported or they haven't been required to report, um, say, financial data to us. So the researchers were able, though, to estimate for those charities looking at um, the peers or very similar charities to, to make an informed um, uh, estimate of, of the data. Okay, right. Um, to give a, a fuller picture of the charity sector, extrapolating from the information that we do have to, to give a fuller picture for, for people. Exactly. Okay, yeah. right. Um, the, the second point here, a closer look at, at indicators of sustainability. Um, mm. Can you give us an explanation of what what that means and, and what those indicators are? Yeah, sure. So that's that's talking about um, financial sustainability in this instance. And it just means that um, for the first time the researchers have applied some basic measures of that, such as um, uh, income margin, so like uh, how much charities are left over with each year after they've uh, accounted for all their expenses, um, and also things like um, how much assets they've got built up um, and you know, sort of how well could they possibly withstand a cut in funding, for example. Oh, okay. So rather than just simply reporting on um, the, the data that was presented, there's also a, a, a sort of uh, speculation but and, and focus on financial stability to give people an indication of how the sector is going in, in that area. Yeah, exactly. And it looks at it by um, different parts of the sector as well. So um, it's just it's interesting to have a look at that. And the third thing on there is um, estimates of change as well. So that's another big thing that's been possible this year for the first time. Now that we've got two years of financial data, we've been able to um, talk about how that data, uh, how charities have changed in the, from 2014 to 15. Oh, okay, so previously we only had one set of data for of financial data, so we couldn't make those comparisons with previous years, but this report is able to do so. Yeah, that's right. Just before we do move on, um, some viewers might have thought already that we're referencing the 2015 report and it's already close to halfway through 2017. Um, is, can you give us an explanation why that may be? I think a few people might be thinking that we've, we've, we're either really slow or we haven't, haven't um, focused on the 2016 report yet. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> a good point. Um, so the 2015 annual information statement, even though it's called the 2015 statement, um, for most charities it wouldn't have been due until the start of 2016 or even the middle of 2016. So um, it's simply a matter that we just have to wait for all the statements to come in before we could analyse them. And then obviously it takes a few months to um, do all the number crunching and produce the report. Okay, so it's um, the most up-to-date information that we have and it just so happens to be that that's the data that came in the 2015 reporting period. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, this report um, does cover the most num uh, the most charities that we've we've ever had a look at, and it has it is the most comprehensive data set. Can you give us um, a brief overview of uh, the the charities that were included, the ones that might not have been included in the research, and why they weren't included? Yes, so some people, um, eagle-eyed viewers if you like, might have noticed that um, 51,000 charities isn't every charity. We do have about 54,000 charities on our register at any given time. Um, but some of them haven't um, been included and the reason for that is um, there's about 800, first of all, that report to the Office of the Registrar of Indig sorry, Indigenous Corporations or ORIC. Um, so those they were excluded because we, we don't actually have any information really right, about okay. it. Um, but also there are a small number of charities that haven't provided statements to us for two years 
um, and therefore they meet the criteria to be deregistered. It's just that they haven't quite been yet. So those ones were excluded. Okay, so at the time that the data was um, uh, downloaded or accessed for, for an analysis, um, there were a bunch of charities that, that fit the bill for deregistration but just hadn't been deregistered yet. So they make up the number of 54,000 registered charities but of course they couldn't be analysed because we didn't have the data that was required. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And I guess we um, sort of think that if they hadn't lodged for two years that they may not have been operating that year. So we okay. left them out just in, just in case. Yeah, yep. right, right. And um, the third point on this slide says modelling to estimate financial data for 25% of charities. Is this what you were talking about before with the extrapolation that the researchers did? Yes, it is. Um, and it might seem like a lot of charities to, to estimate 25%. Um, however, the researchers um, said because the charities are quite small, generally the ones that we're missing the data for, they think it's only made um, up to a 5% difference to the overall headline numbers. Oh, okay, right, right. So even even though the the, the, the sheer amount seems like a, a lot, that it only it only um, refers to a, say a small slice of, of the total pie. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, Having a look at the report, uh, or some of the details of the report, um, can you give us an overview of, of, of what we've learned, the, the bigger picture? Hmm, sure. So look, the first big message I'd say we can get from this report is that it's a very significant sector. It's not only um, one that makes a huge contribution to Australian society and helps people all over the country but uh, and the world, but is also um, a major employer. A, a big recipient of income, um, big source of expenditure as well on delivering services, um, and a, yeah, very big employer. In fact, um, the report found that income is about eight percent of overall GDP. Right. I think that's probably a stat that most people would find um, surprising about the charity sector. Um, the income there, oh, people can see on the screen at the moment, a, a screenshot from the um, the data on the website. The total income, um, $134.5 billion, that's, um, that's an increase on the previous year's report? Yeah, it is. So um, the previous year's report didn't include all charities, so it would have been lower anyway. Uh, it was always going to be an increase, but um, the report did find that the income of uh, those charities that lodged last year and this year rose by t about 2%. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, One of the other interesting um, pieces of information on, on this slide in particular is um, in, in the bar graphs there, we can see the top religion is number of, under number of charities by sector. Um, religion makes up the greatest number of charities, the report found? Yeah, that's right. Um, so. Yeah, it's religious charities make up um, the highest proportion of the sector. So it's about 31% of um, charities that have that have religion as their main activity. So what do you what does it mean to be a religion and, and fit into this category? So it just means that they nominated that their main activity was religion. Um, it, so that could mean um, that, for example, they were a church or a, a mosque, a synagogue, etc. It could also mean that they, while they have that as their main activity, that they're involved in other things too, like health or education. Okay, so it's not solely religious activities. It could be um, the, the main thing being religion, but it could come in uh, collaboration with a bunch of other. Yeah, other that's things. right. Okay. Yeah. And I think one surprising thing on this slide, just before we move on, that people may find um, interesting as well is, is right down the bottom, international. I think a lot of people have a... a in impression that the charity sector is made up largely of organisations that operate overseas in in um, developing nations or, or conflict zones, and it act, the data shows that this is actually quite a small number of charities. Yeah, so um, a lot of the big name charities, I suppose, that you can think of might be thought of as international charities, but that they definitely don't make up the um, the bulk of the sector. Um, but an important thing to note is that. A lot of charities in the other categories, so charities whose main activity wasn't international, they would still, many of them have involvements overseas. Oh, okay. Again, so the, the point being that 
these categories aren't um, mutually exclusive and they're not sole categories. So if an organisation has listed international activities as its main, they may have several other activities that they also fit into. So this, this is showing just what charities identified as being their own main purpose. That's right. Okay. Yep. The report found that there were um, quite there was quite a discrepancy um, across the across the country. Can you just give us a rundown on that? Yeah, sure. So um, this graphic shows the percentage of the total charities in each state and territory, um, and it does map fairly closely to the population in in each, you know across Australia. Say, for example, New South Wales, about a third of the charities. They also have about a third of the population. Um, and you can see that charities are uh, spread across, um, they're not all in cities, so two-thirds of them are, but um, there's a further 30% in regional areas and 3% in what was referred to as rural areas. But, but there are some differences, as the next chart shows, uh, in terms of um, charities not being exactly equally distributed around the country. So, for example, in Queensland you can see there are a relatively low number of charities per head of population. So there's 1.6 charities for each 1,000 people based in Queensland. And on the other extreme in the ACT, um, there's 2.9 charities per 1,000 people. And those two, those two colours and the, the two different numbers that we see there in that graph, graph, we've got based in jurisdiction and operated in jurisdiction. Can you just explain what the difference between those two are? Yeah, sure. So a charity might be based in one state or territory but also operate in another state or territory. Um, and some, uh, as this chart shows, some states or territories have a lot more charities operating in them per head of population than are based there. Okay. So, so just taking one extreme in the Northern Territory there, you can see for every 1,000 people there are 15 charities operating in the NT. Yeah, right, okay. But only two charities um, based. Yeah, exactly. So okay. that sort of indicates that there are a lot of charities from other states and territories helping people in the NT. Right, right, okay. And moving on, having a look at what the report found about charity size, I think this might surprise some people as well. Yeah, so most charities are small. Um, and by small we mean they have um, less than $250,000 in income. So that's about two-thirds of charities that fit into that category. But even within that, 37.1% of charities are extra small, so they have less than 50,000 of income. Okay, so the ACNC's category will define anything under 250,000 annual revenue as small, but e even a large proportion of that is, is quite big compared to how small many of the charities are. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then on the other side of things, there are some very large charities in Australia. So there are... Um, uh, at least about 4% that have more than 10 million of income each year. Yeah, right. Um, and but the ACNC's category for large is just from a million dollars onwards. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So even though some go way beyond that, um, they, they still fit within the, the category of a large charity. Yes. But for the purposes of this report, the researchers have figured it was useful to, to break it down a little bit further to show that there are some, well, as we got on this screen, X, X, L, extra, extra large charities, some extra large charities within the broader category of large charities. Yeah, and exactly. So it just gives a bit of a richer picture than our three categories. And how does that compare with the income of the sector? So the main thing uh, to note with the income of the sector is it's not evenly distributed across charities, as, as you might expect with some of those very large ones there. So in fact, 90% of the income is received by the top 10% of charities. So that would be the probably the, the XXLs, and the XLs take up pretty much most of the, well, the reported income within the charity sector. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then you can see on this chart what it shows as well, this, this page, is the proportion of um, income that comes from different sources. So on the information statement, we ask about three categories. Um, so you've got uh, donations and bequests, government grants, and then um, I think that should say other revenue. Um, so 
you can see there that the majority of money for charities actually comes from this one described as other revenue, um, and then government grants are another significant part. Donations and bequests overall on the scale of the whole sector are about 8.3%. Which is pretty small, I would think. Uh, well, a lot of people would assume that donations probably make up the la largest part of a charity's revenue and, and is often thought of as the lifeblood of a charity, but the, the report shows that it's really small compared with government grants and this other revenue. Again, even though the slide there says income and revenue, it's a, it should say other revenue. So other revenue and government grants actually dominates the, um, the income in the sector broadly at the aggregate level. That's right, at the aggregate level. So for some charities, um, donations and bequests certainly would make up um, more than half of their, uh, you know, a very large part of their income. But on an aggregate level, um, it gets influenced by things like, uh, so universities or uh, schools. Uh, there is, they receive a lot of income from things like um, fees or, um, say, aged care. They might get a lot of fees um, and service fees paid. So that um, ends up being uh, sort of overwhelming, I guess, a lot of the right, right. other stats. So it distorts yeah. the view a little bit because at the aggregate level, it, it show it's influenced by, as, as we mentioned, these larger charities mm. which might not rely on donations in the, by the nature of what they do um, in the same way that um, some of the smaller or medium charities do and therefore the stats indicate that there, well, the stats suggest that there are less, um, there is less demand on donations than, than there really might be for a lot of charities. Yeah, that's right. And the great thing about this interactive data cube and even the larger report, the 140-page one, is you can um, see the, the more detailed breakdown um, by size and sector and things to, to sort of um, get through some of the distortions perhaps. Yeah, right. Yeah. So whilst it's good and interesting to see some of these aggregate level stats, they don't really um, paint a finely detailed picture of the charity sector and individual charities um, doing work. That's right. Yeah. Okay, and how about, well, we touched on this, but how about the income as um, according to the sector? How, how does the, what does the report tell us? Yeah, so as you can see there, um, there's a whole lot of circles and each one represents a sector of the charity's population. Um, so, and the size of the circle uh, represents how much money, how much income that sector had. So education and research is the largest one there, then followed by health, social services, um, and then development. Uh, so I guess that's just sort of showing you um, the size uh, by income of each sector. And that's probably, again, we speak about distortions at the aggregate level, but education research involves lots of research institutes and uh, universities. Mm. So by the nature of them being as, as big as some of them are, it, it's naturally going to be the biggest circle in this in this diagram. Yeah, that's right. And you can see that religion, even though it's the largest by number, it's not the largest by income. Yeah, and right. I guess uh, it makes sense if you think about, um, say, churches and things. They may not be, you know, having they get donations. They might not have a hot, huge volume of um, income from, say, the government or yeah, fees. Yeah, right. Yeah. And just incidentally, this is a screenshot from the website. This is the the sort of visual representation that you will be able to access when you do log in and and have a play around with the data. What does the report tell us about donations? We mentioned that it, at the aggregate level, once again, the aggregate level, it doesn't represent the greatest amount of revenue for the charity sector, but what are some of the details the report does tell us? Yes, I think the um, you know, very interesting one is that there were $11.2 billion of donations made to charities um, in 2015. So obviously that's a huge amount in a population of 20 million people. Um, they make up a small proportion, as we said, of total income, but one quarter of charities do rely on donations to make up half or more of their income. And as I mentioned, we were able to see how um, financial information changed between 2014 and 15, and so we found that donations grew by 2.4% in that year, which um, is actually uh, a bit more than inflation. Yeah, right, which is encouraging, I guess, for a lot of uh, charities out there to know that the report shows that people are still giving and still have a commitment to the charity sector and want to give. 
the report also had a look at um, the people involved in charities. And you mentioned briefly at the very beginning, it's a large employer in the country. Can you um, just run through some of the uh, details that the report shows about the people involved in charities? Yeah, sure. So um, as the slide says, charities employed 1.2 million Australians, um, which if you looked at charities as being an industry, they would employ less charity that they would be second only to the retail industry in terms right. of employment. Um, yeah, and larger charities, uh, I guess intuitively, um, have more staff um, than smaller charities. In fact, um, a lot of charities don't have any staff at all. Um, those that are more likely to have staff are the ones involved in education, aged care and social services. I think that would probably be consistent with most people's um, view of the sector because it's hard to run an an aged care home or a university without any staff just on the backs of volunteers it's it's a little bit it's um, a little bit tricky yeah that's right <laughs> but again on the flip side there are a lot of charities that um because of the nature of what they do and the size and, and where they are they may be able to operate um solely with volunteers mm. and even those that do have staff um you can see uh, 80 percent of all charities engage at least one volunteer so um in many cases, it might be you know one or two staff members, but then also uh, very much supported by volunteer effort as well. And I think this stat, the 1.2 million employees, again is is probably well, it's probably surprising for a lot of people, but it's um, probably a reflection of the types of organisations that are registered as charities, but many people wouldn't ordinarily think of as charities, and we've referred to these quite a bit so far, but a university, a school, aged care facilities, hospitals in some cases as well. So even though we say 1.2 million um, are employed by the charity sector, it's across a wide range of organisations that probably um, that probably go beyond what many people ordinarily think as charities. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning that um, one of the focuses of this report was sustainability, financial sustainability in particular. What did the report um, tell us about the sector and its sustainability? Okay, so um, I do need to say it's a, it is a very complex picture and it's hard to make any generalisations about the whole sector. Um, so it is important when looking at any of these stats to realise that they're um, organisations have different natures, different funding environments, different strategies. Um, but the report did take a look at um, a few key indicators. So they looked at financial performance, which is um, talking about how much um, surplus or deficit charities had at the end of the year. A financial position, which looks at um, the strength, I guess, of the assets that the charity has built up and uh, against their liabilities. And then it tries to sort of combine both of those and some other ratios to uh, build what they've called a sustainability framework. So it might be a bit tricky to um, go over that in the webinar today, but you, you can have a look at that in the report and also on the interactive data cube. Okay, and this is another one, as you mentioned, it's tricky and it's probably uh, doesn't, doesn't do individual charities a service by looking solely at the aggregate data. So if we have a look at look at the data from a really high level and see what the sector as a whole looks like, mm. that's not going to tell the story of particular charities in particular locations at a particular time. There may be some that map almost perfectly to mm. the aggregate um, assessment, but then there would be some that buck that trend and are nowhere near as financially sustainable and others that are, are, are very well secure. That's right. And so what something that really illustrates that is, um, I think on the next slide, uh, you can see that overall, if you look at the whole sector, it had an average net income of 8.7%. So that means on average charities um, had 8.7% more income than they had expenses. Um, but there, within that, there would be charities that had, had negative net incomes or that had much um, positive net incomes. Again, so whilst it's, it's interesting and it's a good look at the sector um, from a high level and, and to get an idea of the, the sort of um, direction that it's taken broadly, it's not really the sort of stat that you would use to, to make 
definite conclusions about any particular type of charity or any particular uh, service provider in a particular region. That's right. So view these stats with an eye of interest, but also caution. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The report also had a look at change in the sector, and this being a feature because of the access to uh, a second lot of financial data following the 2014 annual information statement. What did the report this year, what, what was it able to tell us about change in the sector? Yeah, so um, the report, this section of the report looked at about 30,000 charities that had reported in both 2015 and 2014. So we were able to directly compare those and see how they've changed. Um, so that some things that um, were interesting to see were um, that employment grew. So there was an increase of 7,368 employees or about 0.7% of the total. Um, and they uh, grew primarily in part-time and casual employees. Uh, there's also was uh, increased staff numbers um, in particular in the education and aged care sectors. Uh, sorry, in primary education. But then there was a bit of a drop off in um, higher education. As to why, I couldn't say. Right. <laughs> it prompts a, a question, I guess, for others to look into. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, the, the increase in um, higher education, sorry, the, the decrease in staff numbers in, in, in higher education, given that this type of charity is likely to represent a greater number of staff. Do you think that would have a disproportionate effect on the overall view of the charity's um, employee numbers? Yeah, they could do. It could be one of the reasons, yep. Where, where an organisation that has a lot of employees loses a few, it might, it might have a, a greater impact and maybe even uh, provide a distorted picture of how many employees might have been lost in that year. Yeah, that's Again, true. the aggregate level is pretty difficult when you consider the diversity of the charity sector and, and the range of organisations that, that are included. Yeah, so, and this slide's just looking at the finances again. So I think we mentioned um, income went up by about 2%. Uh, assets also grew um, by 5%. So and that seems to have been, you know, a bit more, quite a bit more than CPI. Um, and again, it was highest for health charities. Um, say so health charities grew by 8.7%. Again, um, because they're such a big part of the sector, that might have um, amplified the total asset growth number. Right. Any indication why health charities in particular? Uh, <laughs> no. That's something uh, for people to look up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The um, the report. Um, given that it's the most significant one thus far, it's had the most comprehensive data set and it's allowed us to compare in a way that we haven't been able to previously. What are the, what are the main messages coming out of the report? Um, so, yeah, again, I guess it's just um, very uh, clear that it's a very significant sector, but also that it's very diverse. Uh, so. I think we've touched a few times during this webinar on the difference it can make when you look at the overall sector, but when you drill down and look at all the different parts of it, it's really quite fascinating to see the differences that do exist um, in all kinds of in all kinds of characteristics. Um, it's, I think that as the first comprehensive data set, um, it's really laid a great foundation for us to uh, build on over time um, and keep looking at change um, in future years. And it is there, available freely for everyone at australiancharities.acnc.gov.au. I will mention once more that don't put the www at the beginning there. It might take you to an error page and confuse people the way it did me. So just type it in as it is and you should be able to find it. Um, oops, sorry, we'll go back there. Okay, Ross, we did have a couple of um, questions that came through which... Uh, the answers of which will be useful for people having a look um, at the data. But one of the most common ones that we got for people registering for the webinar was um, seeking a list of the top charities. Is, is there a top 10 or an easy way to get to get a list of, of the biggest? Yeah, so um, 
when we say top charities, uh, I'm guessing people might mean um, by income. Um, so the report actually does have in the 140 page version, Appendix C has lists of charities with the highest income, um, both overall and also within each of the specific sectors. Um, we did get a couple of char uh, sorry questions about the the top, not income but top performing charities or, or the way to assess charities. It seems that this is a fairly um, interesting aspect of research on the charity sector. Does the report cater for that? Um, so the report allows you to see the, uh, I guess, key financial indicators for sectors. Um, it doesn't attempt to sort of rank charities or um, give charities ratings or, or etc. Um, and that's just because it is so difficult to do that. Um, as I think we've displayed throughout the webinar, there's no one size fits all um, metric or way to um, assess such a diverse group of organisations. Yeah, and and trying to do so for one charity that does a particular thing in a particular area um, won't necessarily uh, give you the the right result when you apply it to another charity in another area doing a different thing. So yeah. whilst you can look at some key financial indicators or, or the, the things that you might think are important in running a charity, the report doesn't make that judgment. And again, it's important to know that it, it's one that's almost impossible to make given how mm -hmm. different the organisations within the charity sector are and the different services that they, they provide. Hmm. Um, another question that we had uh, that was that came in through the registration report was about um, religious charities, why they are the largest in the sector. Hmm. Again, a lot of people wouldn't think of religious organisations as being charities as such, but they make up the greatest number. Yeah, that's right. So they just... Um I guess to a certain extent they just are. It's hard to it's hard to say, but right. uh, but uh, religious uh, religion is certainly a recognised charitable per charitable purpose, um, and it, it, I guess there's just um, a large number of them, th thousands of churches and other religious. Do you think it might have been because you mentioned at the beginning that this is based on the annual information statements that charities provide to the ACNC? So an organisation that does a few things, religion being one of them or maybe mm. the underlying purpose. Do you think um, organisations that maybe uh, choose to select that as their main uh, might influence this number, whereas they, they also do a whole bunch of other things, mm. but then when you look at the stat alone, it, it's probably almost, almost a disproportionately large amount because they've decided just to select religion as their main as opposed to other other um, types of activities. Yeah, definitely that seems sensible. Um, another question we had, more on, on the financials um, of charity charities, is about the um, uh, spending. So why have charities spent 91% of their income on expenses? Yeah, so the report found that charities received over $134 billion of income and spent $123 billion on pursuing their charitable purposes. Um, obviously, I guess to pursue your charitable purposes and to help beneficiaries, you do need to spend money, whether that's on wages or providing services or buying buying goods to distribute, etc. So, um, so when we say expenses in this, I think a lot of people might get confused about that. They think that an expense is um, an unnecessary cost that could be cut or at least saved on. Hmm. That, that's not what it refers to, right? That's right. So expense just means everything that the charity um, had to spend money on, but that, that could include things like paying a, um, paying a wage for a, a nurse to deliver aged care services or a teacher to teach a class um, of disadvantaged people or, um, or whatever it happens to be. So. Um, for example, a hospital is heavily reliant on staff um, and the schools and universities and scientific research can't be undertaken without scientists. Uh, scientists so. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, it's not that um, charities are 
are using 91% of the income on things that they don't need to do and that's the expense that a lot of people might think. It's that they are, they're using their money on precisely the activities that they're set up to, to do and that's what's considered expenses. Um, we, have one more, we have one more question that we think might be useful um, for people. Oh, uh, at the beginning, the, the numbers of total charities and the numbers that were analysed um, was not the same. We, we talked about that. But um, why are some other charities withheld from, from the data? We mentioned the ones registered with ORIC. Hmm. Um, how about some of the others? Uh, so uh, when we throughout the report, um, it includes uh, all the charities in the sector. But if you go to the data cube, you won't quite see that many on there. Right, And the reason for that is because under the ACNC's legislation, some charities are able to apply to have their data withheld. And that's um, there's only limited circumstances where they can do that. And that's things like where it could endanger public safety, um, such as, say, a, a women's shelter. Um, if, if their address uh, was published on the data cube or able to be seen on the map, obviously that would be a yeah, concern. Yeah, right, of course. Um, and so when that's the case, they, we've left them out of the data cube. Okay, that is about it from us today, and that wraps up today's webinar. Um, of course, we wouldn't want you to leave the charities report there, so we do encourage you to go to the website australiancharities.acnc.gov.au and explore the data for yourself. You can find out some really interesting things about the sector or about particular areas of Australia or uh, particular services provided by particular organisations. It, it, it really is um, up to you what you want to have a look at and, and it's all there freely available for you to play around with. If you do have any uh, questions about the report or anything you want to follow up with us, feel free to send us an email at to education at acnc.gov.au. We'll be able to get back to you pretty promptly and answer whatever questions you might have. The um, next report uh, Ross, I presume, is going to be called Australian Charities Report 2016. <laughs> That's right. Um, when can interested people expect that? So I'd be looking out for that one about December this year. Okay. Later in the year we'll expect the release of that one. And again, well, we can assume that it's um, going to have even more features and tell us more about the charity sector. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us today for today's webinar. Um, if you are interested in our webinar program, please go to our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. We have a list of the topics that we'll cover this year. Usually our webinars are once a month. Um, and if you're interested in any of the upcoming topics for the rest of the year, please register there. Also, if you have any feedback about the webinars more generally beyond just um, today's and the Australian Charities Report, also send us an email to education at acnc.gov.au. We always appreciate feedback and we like to improve things. So if you have any comments, suggestions, um, pl please let us know. Once again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you found it interesting and we hope you can find the time to go to the uh, report website, australiancharities.acnc.gov.au and have a play around with the data and see what you can find. Thanks for joining me today, Ross. Uh, thanks, my pleasure. Thanks everyone. We look forward to having your company at the next webinar. Bye.